Welcome to the March 7th meeting of the British Empire Study Group. We are a bunch of philatelists who enjoy history. There's some non-collectors too, so you don't have to be a philatelist. We meet online and everyone is welcome. What I would like to do, some of you may not uh, know, but before before I get into the housekeeping, I just would like to acknowledge the passing of Randy Neal, who was a, I believe he was a Liechtenstein winner, a really nice guy. So uh, just keep him in your thoughts. You know, he's a great philatelist, great knowledge. Our next meeting will be on April 11th, for those of you in the United States. Uh, I believe the tax day is April 15th. So this is a very appropriate program. It's Dr. Ian Matherson presenting entertainment tax. So that's, a, I think, pretty appropriate for those of us in the US for an April discussion. Now I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Rob Lutens, to introduce our guest tonight, Mr. Robin Harris. Rob, please. Thank you, Joan. And let me welcome everyone this evening to our topic, the evolution of the Unitrade catalog. Philately is full of specialty catalogs that focus on a particular area in greater depth than the larger general catalogs permit. The Unitrade catalog is the only specialized stamp catalog for Canadian stamps. Our presenter this evening, Robin Harris, will explore the new features that have been added to each catalog over the last 19 editions, giving us an insight into its evolution. Uh, let me share a little bit of background on our presenter this evening, Robin Harris. Robin's been a stamp collector for nearly 60 years. His main interest is primarily with definitives, particularly those of Canada and the Great Britain Machins. He's been editor of the Unitrade Specialized Catalog of Canadian Stamps since 2005. The editor of the Corgi Times, a bi-monthly newsletter of the Elizabeth II Study Group of Bean Apps since 2001. He's been the editor of the Canadian Philatelist since 2019, author of the Canadian Stamp News Around the World bi-weekly column since 2011, and is the author of several specialized books on Canadian definitives. Robin is a life member and fellow of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada, the British North America Phil Philatelic Society, a recipient of the Order of the Beaver Lifetime Achievement Award, and a member of the American Philatelic Society. So without further ado, let's see our presenter this evening, Robin Harris. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Rob. And thank you to the British Empire Study Group and all of you here today for taking the time to be present as we discuss the evolution of the Unitrade catalog from 2005 to the present day. I have given a similar talk on this topic a couple of times previously, each time to a slightly different audience. Today's talk will bring us up to date with the 2024 edition. The Unitrade Specialized Catalog of Canadian Stamps, illustrated here, is simply referred to as the Unitrade Catalog. It is devoted to the Stamps of Canada. The latest edition is some 808 pages, spiral bound and printed on 8.5 by 11 inch paper. When I took over the editing of the catalog with the 2006 edition, it was a measly 568 pages. Today's presentation includes the topics you see noted here. I will be reading from a prepared script, more so so that I don't forget anything or go on a long-winded tangent. I expect this to take about 46 and a half minutes, and then we will open it up to any questions or comments. It is my understanding that I was the first stamp collector to edit the Unitrade catalog. I will give a brief background on some of my philatelic endeavors so that you can get an idea of who is editing and updating the catalog these days. Hopefully this will put into perspective the amount of changes that have been made to the catalog over the years. I have a few collecting interests, one of which is surely the Canadian stamps from the Elizabethan era. My first big Canadian specialty was the so-called Environment Definitive Series of 1977 to 1987. During the 70s, 80s, and 90s, 
my father and I purchase hundreds and hundreds of pounds of mission mixtures from local charities in Winnipeg. My father would do the initial soaking and sorting before I studied the stamps in more detail. We have estimated that we have over 2 million used Canadian stamps sorted and arranged for easy study. I began collecting in the mid 1960s by rating my father's worldwide collection. At the time, I was interested in the stamps of the United States. In the 1980s, I made an exhibit on the American Revolution, an article of which ran in the Canadian Philatelist in 2020. Another long lasting interest of mine are the Machin stamps of Great Britain. I particularly enjoy the study of definitives. I feel that is where most of the varieties are, including many that can still be discovered to this day by the studious collector. And like many collectors, I also enjoy the Penny Black, the first postage stamp issued in the world, particularly those that have my initials in the lower corners. In 1997, I began developing a series of specialized books on the Canadian Elizabethan era definitives. It was the development of these specialized books that took me to Saskatoon Stamp Centre. I moved the family and worked there from 1997 through 2002, primarily to develop a new database system and website. I have created a number of other philatelic websites, including my own. Here is the stamps page from the site, which will lead you to several resources that I have developed over the years. Included here are erratas for the United, for the, sorry, the Unitrade catalog that point out any mistakes that have been reported from year to year. In 2001, I was asked to be editor of the Corgi Times. This is the bi-monthly newsletter of the Elizabethan Study Group under the auspices of BNAPS. I am nearing the end of my 23rd year as editor of this journal, with over 135 editions produced for our 100 plus members. In late 2018, I was asked to be editor of the Canadian Philatelist, the bi-monthly journal of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada. I am now into my sixth year in this role. Why that spiel? I am proud of my background as a longtime stamp collector and philatelic author. Hopefully this has shown the enthusiasm and knowledge I bring to my editing of the Unitrade catalog as a stamp collector first. Before getting into the Unitrade in more detail, let's take a quick look at some other Canadian catalogs that have appeared over the years. For many, this could be a trip down memory lane. Firstly, here are three books that provided specialized information on the so-called classic stamps of Canada. We have the Boggs, Jarrett, and Holmes references and catalogs. Boggs has information up to 1939, Jarrett to 1928, and the last annual catalog from Holmes appeared in the early 1960s. A go-to book for printing information is Douglas and Mary Patrick's Canada's Postage Stamps book, which lists stamps to 1964. Glenn Hansen produced a couple of editions of his guidebook and catalog of Canadian stamps. It had a tremendous amount of great information, but was last published in 1974. One of the books to be titled Canada, one of the first books to be titled Canada Specialized had a couple of editions, the last appearing in 1981. Charlton produced a specialized Elizabethan era catalog in 1982. And lastly, one of the most popular catalogs of the 70s and 80s was certainly Lyman's standard catalog, but that was not overly specialized. I trust that many of us have some or all of these in our philatelic library for reference purposes. Well, how did I become the editor of the Unitrade catalog? I received a phone call from Gino Casa, the owner of Unitrade Associates in November 2004, asking if I would like to be the editor. I don't think Gino had even finished the question before I was answering yes. I had wanted that job for years, but never expected the opportunity would arise. I did not apply for the job and am still curious to this day as to how it fell into my lap. As an aside, 
I live in the middle of nowhere in southern Manitoba in Canada. The offices of Unitrade Associates are in Toronto, Ontario, some 1,500 kilometers distant from where I live. Interestingly, I did not actually see the folks in person at Unitrade Associates until well after my first edition was edited, printed, and shipped the following summer. It was quite a trustworthy experience. Here we see the covers of the Unitrade catalog over the last number of years. The one in the upper left corner, 2005, was the edition that had just become available to collectors when I received the call. I began with the 2006 edition. I have now finished 19 editions over the years, with the 20th hopefully coming out at some point. Please do not ask me where that time has gone. There are three areas of the catalog that I have little or no involvement with. The business side of Unitrade, the advertising, including the ads that appear within the catalog, and the cover. I have been asked to provide suggestions for stamps that appear on the cover, but otherwise I am not involved with the design of it. Which, by the way, is the one area that I receive the most compliments about, on something I do not even create. Let's look at how my first edition went. I received a DVD from the folks at Unitrade in late 2004 that contained the 2005 edition. The files had been prepared using that Corel Ventura software. At the time, I was a devoted WordPerfect fan and still am to this day for my day-to-day -day word processing needs. Not knowing anything about Ventura, I figured I could redo the entire catalog using WordPerfect. I made a couple of test pages in WordPerfect to see what would be involved in developing the catalog using it instead of Ventura. I was hopeful that it wouldn't take much time to convert and develop the catalog with my favorite program. It turns out that although WordPerfect is the best word processor on the market, it wasn't quite up to the task of desktop publishing that was required for a catalog of this size. Since I didn't know Ventura, I looked into the most popular and best software available at that time for desktop publishing, the Adobe InDesign product. Here's what it looks like. InDesign is a page layout program, not a word processor. It did take quite some time to learn many of the features of InDesign, as well as how it thinks and works. But all these years later, I am thankful for taking the time to get to know the program. I now do all of my book and newsletter work with it. We will come back to this a little bit later on. When I was asked to be editor in late 2004, I was told by a couple of collector friends that there were many mistakes in the Unitrade at that time. However, here's one from that 2005 edition, the one prior to my taking over. In this instance, the same picture has been used for two different listings. That is certainly not a mistake one would think could possibly happen, and one that I certainly would not make. But I replicated the mistake in my very first edition. It shows that no matter how much you proof your own material, mistakes, even ones that appear quite glaring once they are pointed out, can happen. When I finished my first edition, I was actually quite proud of what had been accomplished and felt that it was virtually mistake-free. How wrong I was. Shortly after publication of that first edition, I received several lengthy emails from observant collectors who were pointing out various typographical mistakes. The most common type of mistake seems to be the old copy and paste type. This happens when the details of one listing are copied for another, and then something is missed during the subsequent editing process. To this day, I still regret every mistake that misses the proofing process, but I'm grateful when they are pointed out. The mistakes are corrected immediately so that next year's catalog is even better. When I took over as editor of the Unitrade for the 2006 edition, I had many ideas. This included how the various listings in the catalog should be formatted and the type of content that should appear in the catalog. Let's take a look at the many changes and additions that took place with my first Unitrade. Unitrade 
Here is the five cent Canadian stamp from 1965. On the left is what the listing looked like in the 2005 edition, and a comparison with the revised layout for the 2006 edition shown on the right. Besides changing the layout slightly, each listing had several new details added, including the name of the designer and engraver, the latter if applicable. Also, the method of printing and the pain size was included. All comb perforated stamps were measured to the nearest tenth. In this example, this stamp is line perforated, not comb perforated, so the gauge is not shown to tenths. And if a postage stamp design also appeared on postal stationery, a footnote was included to point the collector to that, which is the case with this stamp design. When I was adding new entries to the catalog, and still to this day, thought is given to how any addition will impact both the specialist and the novice collector. So-called padding was addressed with the reformatting of the catalog from 2005 to 2006. Notice here on the left how an entire page was used to illustrate a single pane of six stamps in the 2005 edition. That is clearly a waste of space. On the right is how the 2006 edition displayed these NHL stamps. Each of the 12 varieties is illustrated in nearly full size, along with the pane of six and booklet pane of six illustrated at a reduced size. When it comes to stamps issued in a series, every effort is given to illustrating the entire series together rather than splitting the stamps apart, assuming the Scott numbers are sequential. A quick sidetrack. The Unitrade catalog uses the Scott numbering system, which is the most used numbering system by collectors in Canada and the United States. On the left, we see the King George VI piece issue from 1946 as the listings and illustrations appeared in the 2005 edition. On the right is my first edition where the entire series of stamps are pictured together. In addition, notice that the corresponding airmail stamp that was issued as part of the piece issue is shown nearby. The listing for the airmail stamp is still shown in the so-called back of the book, but having the illustration up front beside the rest of the stamps in the series gives a nice hint to the collector that something else is available for this series. Also added are references to other formats for these stamps, specifically that there are OHMS and G overprinted issues. Another significant change for my first edition was the displaying of complete booklet panes in color. Previously, booklet panes were shown in black and white, and some of the larger format panes were split and did not show the entire pane. In fact, over 90% of the thousands of illustrations in the catalog for the 2006 edition were updated based on new scans that I had prepared and saved over the years, and specifically for the new edition. As a modern collector with, as I mentioned earlier, a couple of million used stamps at my disposal for research purposes, one area of collecting that I enjoy the most is the hunt for constant plate varieties. A concerted effort was made to add many, many more well-known constant plate varieties to the catalog and also to illustrate as many as possible. In addition, images for the older re-entries were improved via the, via the generosity of the reentries.com website also new to the 2006 edition. Index tabs, more accurately called bleeds, were added to the side of the pages. Year title bars were added at the start of each new calendar year. Basic postal rates were listed when postal rate changes occurred. The purpose of showing the basic postal rates is to give the collector the reason why stamps were issued with certain denominations. And as shown with the definitive timeline, a notation was placed in the appropriate date of issue location for those definitives or back of the book stamps that are assigned a number by Scott Publishing that is found somewhere else in the catalog. The stamp itself may be listed several pages away from when the stamp was actually issued. In this way, if you are browsing the listings in a chronological date of issue order, you can see what other stamps, either definitives or back of the book items, were issued during that time period. For several larger definitive series, 
Summarized tables were added to help the collector see what different varieties exist for each stamp series. Over the years, I have used tables extensively to summarize information, similar to the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. On several occasions over the years, Canada Post has issued stamps with unique pane layouts. I felt it was important to illustrate these. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Starting with the 2006 catalog, individual stamps from booklet panes and souvenir sheets were illustrated separately, and the full panes were illustrated with smaller images. I felt that the novice collector would likely have just a used single of the stamp in their hand, so illustrating all of the stamps from a pane or souvenir sheet as individual stamps would make it much easier to locate and identify a stamp. Canada Post has, this, has had several joint issues with other postal administrations over the years. I felt it would be very useful, again, as an aid for the collector, to note and illustrate the foreign country's joint stamp issue. Here we see examples of two of these, the 10 cent US Bicentennial Joint Stamp Issue of 1976 with the United States and the 2004 Joint Stamp Issue with France for the 49 cent stamp issued for the French settlement in Acadia. Also new in 2006 was an expanded introduction. Illustrated here on the left is the new how to use the stamp listings page. Don't tell anyone, but I stole this idea from the Scott catalog. On the right, illustrations showing examples of different tagging formats were added. As an aside, I received many email inquiries from collectors. A good percentage of these questions can be answered by a look through the introduction. I suspect this is one part of the catalog that is often overlooked by collectors. I am a strong advocate that every collector should have a rich and deep philatelic library, both with general type reference books as well as specialized books in one's area of study. As such, scattered throughout the catalog are references to important stamp books that will give the collector far more information on certain stamp series than can be shown or referenced in the Unitrate catalog. Here we see literature references for the Sense, Large Queen, and Admiral stamp issues. Yes, the full title of the Unitrade is the Unitrade Specialized Catalog of Canadian Stamps, but it is literally impossible to list every single variety for every single stamp issue in one book. Referring the collector to other sources of philatelic literature is one way to inform the collector of these other resources. Another new feature with the 2006 catalog was the notation of items that do not exist. That seems like an odd phrase to say. Shown here are the three Wilding Coil stamps that were issued in 1954. These stamps were not issued all on the same date. As such, when Scott Publishing was assigning catalog numbers, they assumed that the three cent Wilding would also be issued in coil format, so they reserved number 346 for it. However, in the long run, the post office did not issue a three cent wilding stamp. Rather than renumber a whole whack of catalog numbers, number 346 was left alone. By placing a small notation to the collector that reads, number 346 is not assigned, ensures that a novice collector is aware that something is not missing from the catalog. By the way, the introduction to the catalog includes a list of all of these unassigned catalog numbers. One other feature that was added to the 2006 edition are tagging errors, more specifically, missing tag and constant tag varieties. Although an ultraviolet light is required to see these otherwise hidden varieties, tag varieties are highly sought after by Canadian collectors. By the way, tag shifts are not included, just like color and perforation shifts are no longer added to the Unitrade. Another type of frequently asked emails that I receive as editor deal with color shifts. It would be impossible to list every known color and perforation shift. And yes, a tag shift is really just a color shift. If we added these kinds of shifts, there would be literally hundreds, if not thousands of new listings. Besides making the listings too overwhelming, 
we still wouldn't be complete. By that I mean any, any multicolor stamp is susceptible to a color shift. This is just the nature of printing. So those are the new and updated features that appeared for my first Unitrade catalog. There was a tremendous amount of time required. As shown earlier, the 2005 catalog was prepared using the Corel Ventura software. All of the listings were converted to Adobe InDesign, which required a significant amount of proofing. Even with the proofing that was done then and continues to this day, a typing mistake that was made 10, 15 or more years ago is still being found today. And I, I am gonna go on a tangent. I did get an email this morning from a gentleman who found a typo uh, from the, my very first edition, still in there 19 years later. For that, I certainly apologize. I hate mistakes more than anyone else. Over the next several slides, we will look at the new features that have been added to the catalog in the years since. I won't spend too much time on each item, but just enough to show what kinds of new features have appeared. So, on to the 2007 catalog. More bleeds were added to the sides of the pages. Shown at right are color bleeds added to the Elizabethan era definitives. If you glance at the right edge of the catalog, these colors make it very easy to open the catalog to the area of interest. Along the bottom of the catalog, bleeds were added noting the basic postal rate errors. In some cases, one can use these notations to move to certain parts of the catalog, at least to the general time period of interest. Quite often, I will have a US or international rate stamp in hand and we'll use the bottom rate information to quickly find the stamp's place in the catalog. More re-entries were added to the catalog in 2007. Finding some definitive stamps can be a relatively time-consuming process. The 2007 Unitrade had a 1997 to present definitive stamp identifier added at the back of the catalog. This now encompasses some 15 pages, but is a useful tool as it groups the definitive series together. 2008, uncut press sheets were summarized in their own section. A topical listing was added near the end of the catalog. Special event covers were added with their own section. And booklet single stamps that did not already have a number assigned by Scott Publishing were added. These are noted by the lowercase s at the end of the number. Moving on to 2009, uncut press sheet gutter combinations have their own section. A new GEMS two-page spread was added to the introduction of the catalog. This section highlights very high quality single stamps that sold at auction over the prior 12 months for prices higher than the very fine catalog price. The VF condition price is the best grade noted in the catalog, but there are many higher quality items sold at auction that are highly sought after by collectors. This two page spread is meant to show that certain stamps will sell for more than catalog price. Also in 2009, Christmas seals were added with their own section. In addition, an alphabetical people listing was added near the end of the catalog with the 2009 edition. If you know the name of the person pictured on the stamp, then this listing makes it very easy to find the Scott number. In 2010, a page was added to the introduction illustrating the different pre-cancel types that exist. Although the Unitrade catalog itself does not list all known pre-cancels, this summary page and notations for the specific stamps that exist in pre-cancel form gives the collector a summary that many pre-cancel varieties do exist. In 1967, the United the United Nations Postal Administration issued five stamps for use at the United Nations Pavilion at Expo 67 held in Montreal. These stamps were expressed in Canadian currency and were only valid for postage on mail posted at the UN Pavilion during the fair. 
a small section was added to reflect these almost Canadian stamps. Moving to 2011, the quarterly packs issued by Canada Post were summarized. And the Quebec Wildlife Habitat Conservation stamps were added. The 2012 edition expanded listings for Newfoundland and semi-official airmails. In 2013, Canada Post picture postage stamps were added. Only those prepared and sold by Canada Post to collectors are listed. That is, picture postage created and ordered by the general public is not listed. Why? Collectors are not given a complete listing of what is available, and I also suspect that many customized picture postage designs are never used and subsequently not seen by collectors, but rather kept as keepsakes. At the lower left, you see an example of personal, personalized picture postage, this one showing my residence. And I'm sitting just inside the window on the front side there that you can see. Of course, I have snow outside right now, not the nice green that you'll, I get in the summertime. Also in the 2013 edition, for the Elizabethan era definitives, a subtle yellow highlighter was added to the first line of a new group of stamp listings. This was done to make it easier to see when each new stamp design begins. Also, small notes were added within the illustrations of those stamp issues that were issued in both self-adhesive and water-activated gum format. The just released computer vended postage stamps required their own section, a new back of the book area added to the 2014 catalog. Another back of the book area now includes Canada Post stamp sponsorship products. This program permitted corporate entities and organizations to partner with Canada Post Corporation to sponsor a specific commemorative stamp issue. Sponsors share the prestige of participation and being identified with Canada Post products increases their profile further. In 2015, we added the New Brunswick numeral cancellation rarity factors. And in 2016, the rarity factors for the British Columbia numeral cancels were added. Also added to the catalog in 2016 was pricing for artists signed duck stamps and two pricing grades for the five hole OHMS orphan stamps. A paper chart of the large queen stamps of 1868 to 1876 was updated in 2016. And more varieties were added as they are every year. 2017 saw a notation added for the 1914 Macdonald Cartier essays, as well as addition of the Newfoundland reply coupons. As new errors are reported and verified, the Unitrade catalog will add the new variety, and I assign our own catalog number in the form of a lowercase Roman numeral, such as I, 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 and so on. When Scott Publishing becomes aware of the new listing, they may, if it meets, meets their policy on listings, assign their own catalog number to the variety. In this case, it would typically be a lowercase letter, such as A, B, C, etc. At that point, the Unitrade catalog must change our Roman numeral listing to match Scott's assignment. A significant number of these number changes happened with the 2017 edition after Scott Publishing had done a major review of their listings. This shows that Scott Publishing does look at the Unitrade catalog just as I look at theirs. As noted previously, I continue to add new entries as they are reported and verified. In 2018, we added a small EP symbol beside those constant plate varieties that are known to exist on every single pane of the larger press sheet. In 2019, pricing notations were added for on-cover examples 
of single usage United States and international rate envelopes. In 2020, the early prepackaged stamps had a new section created. And also for the 2020 edition, the stationary listed listings were removed from the Unitrade catalog. This tough decision was based on a couple of factors. One was that the listings in the Unitrade, at least for the earlier stationary items, were not complete. But more importantly, a long-awaited new editions of Webb's catalog had just been released. Webb's is the go-to source for any Canadian postal stationary item. A collector in this field would almost always refer to the Webb's catalog number, so it didn't make sense to also have a Unitrade catalog number being used in the marketplace. The 2021 catalog saw the early crown circle cancels illustrated. In addition, many new illustrations were added for the thematic and philatelic exhibition cards. As noted previously, a picture really is worth a thousand words. The newly recognized varieties of the repeating Canada underprinting security feature found on certain stamps was now noted in the catalog. This included details and illustrations added to the introduction of the catalog as well as notations placed within the header of the respective stamp listings. It has not yet been determined if we will add new numbered listings for any stamps where more than one type of underprinting variety exists, but I wouldn't be surprised if that doesn't happen down the road. The 2022 catalog has had this stamp printers of BNA stamps noted for the various listings. This information is based on that found in the long out of print home specialized philatelic catalog. You will also find an enhanced listing of the British Columbia numeral cancels. An important rework of the five hole OHMS perfin listings was completed. Previous editions of the Unitrade catalog listed the OHMS perfins based on Wrigley's catalog. Ongoing research has shown that several previously listed items were not officially produced. This section now reflects the findings of the British North America Philatelic Society's Perfin Study Group as published in Canadian Stamps with Perforated Initials 6th Edition, edited by John Johnson and Gary Thomason with help from Patrick Durbano. The catalog numbers have also changed to better reflect the new research. And as a, has been stated more than once, more varieties continue to be added to the catalog every year. In 2023, the annual collections section added images for all of the Canada Post books. In addition, a new section was added to the catalog that listed and illustrated all of the picture postage stamps prepared by Canada Post that were used on their mailings for first day of issue events. What was new in the 2024 edition? The most significant addition is the inclusion of the dimensions of each stamp. The measurement is shown vertically just outside the lower right corner of the stamp design. So, that shows the new features and changes that have been incorporated into Unitrade Specialized Catalog of Canadian Stamps over the last 19 or so years. Perhaps there are one or two features where you said, wow, I didn't know that was in the Unitrade. Before I conclude this presentation, I will give a bit of a background to some questions that I've, I'm asked from time to time. The first has to do with how the catalog is formatted. As noted previously, the Adobe InDesign software is used. Here we see a screenshot of a two-page layout. Unlike a word processor, nearly every item that you see here is its own object. That is, every image is a separate unit. Every caption found under every image is a separate unit. The stamp listings for an, an entire issue is typically its own separate unit. Unlike a word processor where, if done correctly, when you add new co uh, content early in a document, any following content flows automatically from page to page, 
That is not typically the case with an InDesign created document of this nature. Within the contents of Inde context of InDesign and the requirements of these stamp listings, if, if something significant needs to be added in the middle of other listings, quite a bit of manual work is required to move the various objects around the page. Despite the time that is needed to move these objects around and change the layout, perhaps across multiple pages, adding new listings and varieties is certainly more important than any extra time that may be required to make room for the new item. Here is a closer zoom of a typical single stamp listing. Notice the light blue lines. Those are the borders of each object. This particular listing has seven such objects. Two are images, two are captions, one is the arrow pointing to the variety location, there is another object for the title of the stamp, and the seventh object is the full stamp listing. What we are looking at is the default viewing within InDesign. By hitting a couple of keystrokes, the view can exclude the lines and object borders. In addition, the quality of each image can be enhanced. Typically, the image quality is a low res version displayed on the screen in order to speed up the display and movement through the document. The right-hand view is a cleaner look, but where and when the various objects start and stop can no longer be seen. And that kind of information is always useful when editing the document. Note that the catalog is not a database-driven format. Far from it. Any little change needs to be done manually in the various objects throughout the document. The catalog itself is now over 800 pages. Although InDesign, I believe, could handle such a large document in one file, I have opted to split it into many files, mostly for speed. In fact, it is currently split into 30 files. What about the assignment of catalog numbers? There are two aspects to this, either the need to assign a number because of a new found variety or the assignment of a catalog number for a newly released Canada Post stamp. Earlier, we noted that if I add a new variety, I can assign a unitrate type number, that is I, double I, triple I, and so on. Unitrate Associates uses the Scott numbering system, so anytime Scott Publishing adds their own catalog number, the Unitrade catalog must then reflect this. In terms of newly issued stamps from Canada Post, I need to wait for Scott Publishing to assign numbers before I can note that in the catalog. When I am adding the new listings, I typically wait until I receive the new numbers from Scott Publishing. By the way, they do not assign a number until they have received the new stamp issues from Canada Post and are able to visually confirm and develop a suitable listing which, based on how Canada Post now ships outstanding new issue orders, may be two to three months after the stamps have been released. When new stamps are issued from Canada Post, I purchase full panes. Scans are made of the full panes, and then single stamps are removed for scanning purposes. For the self-adhesive stamps, a single is affixed to black paper and then scanned. This is needed to get the details of the die cutting. All of my stamp scans are saved using the Scott catalog number. So if I happen to start to create a listing in the unit trade, when a new issue is released, I will wait to place the images until I have the Scott numbers, since the scan file names are based on their numbering. Earlier, I briefly mentioned that many questions I am asked can be answered by reading the introduction. I suspect that many collectors may have glanced at the introduction, but have not taken the time to read it in any kind of detail. So, I am going to quickly view these pages here and highlight a couple of areas that may show items that some of us didn't know were there. The first page of the introduction includes a comment from myself, which includes a notation of what is new to the catalog this year. The bottom of the page discusses the numbering of stamps and varieties. The next two pages detail how to use the stamp listings, catalog valuing, condition grading, and cancellations are the next topics of discussion. 
The two-page gems section, as we alluded to earlier, follows. Some co stamp collecting basics appear next. A brief discussion of the Lomartin produced coils follows. This in itself could be pages long. Tagging examples follow that. Paper, including fluorescence, is the next topic. Mentioned previously, a brief discussion of the underprinting security feature found on some recent self-adhesive stamps follows. Constant plate varieties, errors, freaks, and oddities are then mentioned. This is followed by the one-page summary of pre-cancels and a very brief glossary of selected philatelic terms. And lastly, very basic postal rates are noted, along with a few links to other resources available on the web. I know you couldn't actually read what was being displayed on the last few slides, but all of us can now say we have at least seen the introductory pages. All your questions are answered there. There is one other page that should be that should not be overlooked, and it is found at the very end of the catalog. It is a symbols and abbreviations page and is a summary of what the title suggests. One last topic of discussion, and that's related to pricing. Let's face it, one of the main reasons collectors buy each year's new catalog is to check on the pricing of certain stamp issues. In the 1970s, when I bought an annual stamp catalog, ironically titled the H.E. Harris Postage Stamp Catalog, there would be a handful of stamps I would look at, look up first, just to see if I could retire. And I was only 10 years old. About a month before I finished the next Unitrade catalog, I received pricing suggestions from several stamp dealers across Canada. Stamp, some send me a few suggestions, while others will send dozens of pages from the catalog with their pricing suggestions marked up. Here we see a couple of examples of the latter. I should point out that I do not buy stamps from collectors on a regular basis. I, like many of you, I'm sure, have sold some duplicate stamps from time to time, but it is not my career. As such, I do not have first-hand experience on determining the prices, pricing of stamps. So I look to the dealers who handle this material regularly. I use a number of dealers because some dealers will have more experience in certain areas of Canadian philately than others. Just like collectors, dealers too have their areas of specialty. Here we see a picture of my office work environment. In this example, you will see several piles of paper laid out. Each pile represents the pricing suggestions received from the different dealers. I do wait for all of the pricing suggestions to come in. I give the dealers a specific deadline before I start updating the catalog with this information. I wait until everything is in because I update the pricing as I work through the catalog from front to back. This requires going to each stamp listing and manually updating the requested price changes within the InDesign document, one entry at a time. There you have it. A look at the evolution of the Unitrade Specialized Catalog of Canadian Stamps from 2005 through the 2024 edition. What will the future hold? Last year, the folks at Unitrade Associates announced that they would be retiring in 2024, this year. There is still no word on the sale of the company to another person. At this time, there may not be a 2025 edition. Perhaps a 2026? Time will tell. I'm afraid I do not know anything else with regards to this. As noted at the beginning of this presentation, I am not involved with anything to do with the business side of the catalog. I again thank you for staying tuned to this presentation and hope that it gave you an insight into how the Unitrade catalog has evolved over the years. I welcome any questions or comments. At the beginning, I said it would take 46 and a half minutes and I'm at 46 and a half minutes. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Like, where have you been all my life with the, all the information that's in there? All right. Thanks, Joe. That was wonderful, Robin. That was very oh, interesting. You.
Um, Daryl Templer asks, is there an online version of the catalog? And if not, is there one in the planning? There is not an online version. And my understanding is that Scott Publishing does not license that. Mm. So no, I don't think there'd be any plans for that in the foreseeable future. Not if we're using the Scott numbers. Okay. We have a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, it's, it's a generalized philatelic question, but wants to know what is tagging? Tagging is a nearly invisible color applied at, on Canadian stamps. It was initially applied to either the sides or a center band down the middle. Nowadays, it's uh, applied to all four sides of the stamp so that when mail is posted in a mailbox and then picked up and, and collected and uh, taken to a Canada Post sorting facility, their sorting machines will look and read this invisible tagging and sort and face the envelope in the proper location way so that a cancellation can sometimes be applied. They're not always canceled in Canada these days. <laughs> and that the address can be read automatically by their machines. Okay, good answer. Good answer there, Robin. Um, Jack Gringlis is asking, he has the 2021 edition and he notes that the Newfoundland listings are not very detailed in perforation varieties when compared to Stanley Gibbons. Um, any insight on that? No comment. I will take oh. that as advisement and uh, see if we can get a comparison done and perhaps add uh, listings that are required. Uh, one of the dealers that does provide pricing information is a noted Newfoundland dealer, and he has not uh, pointed out these omissions, I'll put it. So I will ask him for sure uh, to see if there's if, if, if there's work that needs to be done in that area. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. Okay, from uh, Clive Levinson. <clears throat> Including the stamp dimensions in the catalog is a great idea. Are these from perf tip to perf tip, or is it the dimensions of the actual design? Perf tip to perf tip. Okay. That allows you to then, if you don't own that particular stamp, you could then take the dimension that's noted in the catalog to create your own album pages with a suitable border around it, allowing enough room for the stamp and any other little extra space you want. Right. Okay, another anonymous question here. As a 10-year-old, how did you get interested in stamps? I suspect that one summer morning I was bored out of my tree and I asked my dad what I could do. And he said, here's some stamps I have. Uh, go at it. And very within days or weeks of that, I recall seeing on our pool table in the basement about 50,000 stamps that my dad had ordered. And they were just piled up high that we had a joy going through and sorting and I, when today, even to this day, when I see a picture of one of those stamps, either in an album or online, it brings back some fond memories. Sure. Okay, another question. Uh, if, if another catalog becomes printed, do you think there will be an opportunity to do it into two volumes instead of one? The current size of the catalog cannot expand much further because of the coil binding. They just can't make coil binding that big. In fact, this year's edition, every year we add usually eight pieces of paper ever since I've taken over. Uh, the first edition, we added several pages because of the amount of information that I had added to the catalog. But certainly every year we add at least eight sheets of paper. So over time, that uh, it's getting thicker and thicker. And I've noticed this particular edition, the 2024, it, it seems a lot harder to turn my pages because of the size of the coil binding. So there is a, a physical limit of the coil binding that will require us to split it into two volumes. Yeah. Jim McCormick wants to know if you're still accepting feedback for future editions. 
I am always looking forward to new information, either varieties or information that should be added to the catalog. I continue to add the new listings to it in the hopes that a buyer comes forward any day and says we're doing a 2025 edition. I'm ready for it to go to print. Well, not today, obviously, but I'm ready for it. I will be ready for it to go to print if very short notice is required. So yes, please pass on anything you would like to add it. Uh, any ideas you have, uh, certainly new varieties, please. Okay. Um, Anthony Thompson says, how do you identify the stamp colors listed in the Unitrade catalog? Does it follow Scott and for the shade varieties that reflect printings? What's, what's the reference? Uh, that's a tough question <laughs> to uh <-huh>. answer. <laughs> so when I took over with the catalog, I just took the listings that were there. I cannot say what those, uh, like the classic stamps, what those listings are based on. I don't have that but kind of, that information was never given to me. But thankfully, all of the new entries that are, all the new stamps that come out today are simply multicolored. And that's what I put in, multicolored, unless it's a single color, like a black uh, stamp or something like the, the King George, the, so I keep calling him King George. He's not King George, King Charles stamp, um, uh, which is actually two or three blacks in there. Um, I don't know what the reference is, what, whether it was a Stanley Gibbons color guide or, or what was used for the classics. Uh, sorry, I don't have, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Is I there any possibility? Darn. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Marcel San Luis says, uh, will there be any possibility in the future to have the introduction done in bilingual? You know, the Unitrade catalog actually was bilingual many, 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 many years ago. Um, mm. That's a great question. I can't see why that could not be offered as an online res resource this is, uh, to point collectors to that they could download just the introduction in a bilingual format and print that because there's certainly that there's no conflict there with Scott numbers. So that would be a, a, an interesting idea. All right. Let's see, uh, Rick says, I know that the Unitrade value for very fine stamps is taken from Scott, but how are the Unitrade values for other grades determined? So I didn't know that our very fine pricing was taken from Scott. I would disagree with that. We have dealers who provide, uh, across country, who provide pricing information on uh, all grades of the stamps. So I, the, the information that all pricing comes from suggestions from the dealers that uh, uh, that give us that information year to year. And those dealers are noted in the front of the catalog on the very first page. I believe it's page. Uh, yeah, page one. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you there, Robin. I, I wasn't aware that, uh, that, you know, that it was worked off of the very fine varieties myself. Well, I'm not seeing too many more questions here in the in the columns do we have any any questions out in the in the panels at this point any raised hands i'm not done bringing everyone over yet rob so if i missed you please raise your hand and uh i'll, I see I'll jack you Douglas is here. yeah mm -hmm. jack you're, you're muted right now what's your question hey hi uh Robin, first of all, let me just congratulate you on that presentation. It was really excellent. Uh, I didn't have my stopwatch on, but I think your 46 and a half was about right. Um, Robin, um, I'm just a bit conscious of the fact that Hugh Jeffries is also on the line. Um, and uh, Gibbons is actually my go-to uh, catalogue. But as far as Canada goes, uh, I think yours is fantastic. Um, I asked the question about the perfs. Um, and, for example, if you wanted to note, like, 226 in the Gibbons is equivalent to 208 in uh, in your in the USC. But definitely there's more detail on perfs um, in the Gibbons. And for people that build their albums around uh, the, the Gibbons listings, it's very hard to find Canadian or specifically um, Newfoundland 
stamps that are, sorry, uh, that, that follow the Gibbons numbers, it doesn't appear to be a equivalent uh, for you. So that's just an area that I, I find very frustrating. Um, but uh, other than that, I think the catalog's fantastic. So uh, Thank you. So th there is uh, a Newfoundland specialized catalog produced by rats. The name eludes me out of he lives in Newfoundland, darn. Um, That'd be John Walsh. Uh, John Robin. Walsh, right, right. And uh, I suspect that he would list far, I know he lists far more perforation varieties than we have in the unit trade. So that's another source that we could go to to uh, expand our listings if there's certainly a demand for that. This is the first time I've ever heard that query in my 19 years as being editor that uh, we need more detail on the new flan per. So that I can recall. Maybe we had one years ago that I don't remember, but uh, certainly maybe the second then uh, request we've had on it. So it's something that I'll, uh, I'll certainly look into. Thank you for that, Jack. Thanks, Robin. Uh, William Walton. Yes. I just wanted to comment, Robin. Uh, well, by the way, we're moving ahead to put together the next edition of Web, but we don't know what will happen with that either. But you're obviously a perfectionist looking to create an impossibility, which is an error-free catalog. There are too many data points. We found this with web, which is mammoth, but not nearly as mammoth as Unitrade. But every new edition, we get a host of things reported to us, um, a, a small host, that are errors that, that we've introduced or failed to catch in the past. And we've had the same experience errors that have been there for a couple of decades that somebody suddenly spots. I view that as a clear sign that the catalog is being used by serious people. When you don't get any more typos reported, it means nobody's looking at your book anymore. <laughs> well, and earlier I mentioned, and I agree, Bill, that uh, yes, it's a good sign that people are using the catalog. I, I hinted earlier I forget where I was going already. <laughs> that uh, uh, I hate mistakes. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. If I come back to me, I'll talk about it. Darn. Uh, no, I hate mistakes. Oh, that's what it was. Having an annual catalog, as we do, allows the mistakes to be fixed very relatively quickly. As, at the that same moment that new ones are being introduced. <laughs> don't, don't point that out, Bill. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, Mark, Mark Armstrong, you, you had a question uh, you, you had posted. You want to go ahead and... I, I want to keep my question um, to the editorial ship. I had a business one. I won't bring it into the conversation. Uh, Robin, I'm just one of many collectors that commend you immensely for the amount of effort and work you put in this catalog to help all collectors uh, looking for that Canadian information. It is beyond climbing a mountain. And I just wonder, what is it like for you to have to try and contact and deal with Canada Post officials for maybe one little bit of information you're looking for, whether it would uh, be the uh, image on the back of the stamp with the Canada Post, Postes Canada, um, I, I know Gary Edinger pretty well, the CEO of Canada Post, but how do you get your information? So Canada Post, uh, a couple of ways. Canada Post used to have their stamp details magazine that came out eight or 10 times a year. They've discontinued that. That's where most of the printing details came from. So the last few issues I've had to go online and find their uh, possible resources there. Most of the information is stuff that I, I buy the stamp, I look at it myself, I perf it myself, I get the dimension myself, I scan it myself. If I need a back image, I do that myself. From time to time, we put in a picture of the tagging because it's different. I do that myself. Uh, no images come from Canada Post. I use actual stamps for that. Um, I have a good relationship with certain people at Canada Post in their stamp services department through a lot of my editing with Corgi Times. 
they get that journal and will comment on stuff. I hear from certain people there certainly every few weeks uh, for queries back and forth. Um, but I rarely, rarely ask them for information because I find it myself. Do you ever have to seek permission from Scott's office in the U.S. for any of your work? I've never asked but them. You say permission. that they assign, they assign numbers. Yes. So um, I receive monthly or every two months their snippet of a page from their Scott Monthly Journal where they assign the new Scott numbers, and that's where I get the numbers from. Um, in fact, I may have one. Here's an example of that, that uh, they, they mailed it. Ooh, we're losing the page. They're, I got to get behind it. They, <laughs> yep. uh, they, they send me that. Uh, I don't subscribe to Scott Monthly. It's too expensive for me to pay the whatever the yearly annual fee is. But they, they mail me the one or two pages that I need. And that's when I then usually do the additions to the catalog. And and there's that, no permission required. Although, again, on the business side, the people in Toronto annually have to get a licensing, pay a licensing agreement from Scott right. to put the numbers in the catalog. That's not my department. I don't. Right. It was amazing in the uh, 60s and early 70s, Canada Post, if you were a teacher, Canada Post would send you a whole package of like proof photographs of every stamp, uh, uh, just a whole bundle of material on, on each and every issue. Uh, but uh, it's a new age now. Yeah, well, even you can find on the Canada Post website as new issues come out, if uh, some of their illustrations that they put up there are pre-issue pictures that aren't act the actual stamp as it was issued, they made subtle design changes right near the end, obviously. Um, not every issue, but from time to time that'll happen. Uh, so that's why I wait for the actual stamp and... I stick it on a black piece of paper, scan it, and then I got the details I need from that. And uh, you no, know, it's it's Excellent. mostly my involvement in it. Excellent. Thank you for your work. Thank you. So, just Thanks. on that note, just on that note, it's possible. I hope uh, someone buys out that a new someone comes forward soon and purchases Unitrade, and that the Unitrade catalog continues on in some format. And I hope that they come to me to be the editor of it. But it's possible that whoever buys it could go a different route too. So I hope that doesn't happen that way, obviously. Uh, Self-serving <laughs> comment there. But anyway, thank you. Hello, Sean All right. speaking. Um, would you by any chance consider, Robin, uh, adding the face value of stamps included in each of the uh, annual Canada specialized collections because right now the face value is not identified and we find that that's a difficult uh it's, it's a difficult uh, difficult issue to deal with that would be a great idea be easy to add that we do have in the corgi times i noticed a gentleman is online down there in a, on my screen he's in the lower left corner Mirko zatka who did produce for our corgi times a summary of the actual face value of all the annual collections that is we published in the Corgi Times. But that would be a great little thing to put in there because I do know when you look at auction listings, uh, auction catalogs, they will <laughs> not note the selling price of the can of the annual collection. They put in the face value of the stamps and even then it gets discounted when it finally sells. So <laughs> absolutely. Oh absolutely and uh, another great and idea. The, the so called catalog value of these collections is a little bit out it's out there in uh no man's land so right i can't believe i didn't do that already 19 years ago great idea paul thank you one one quick quick editorial question what is the corgi times for those of us who are not familiar with a you know so early on i dogs? briefly talked I, early on i briefly went through that uh the british north america philatelic society has many study groups per i'm going to say 20 ish estimated 20 it could be 15 to 25 and one of those study groups is the elizabethan study uh study group which we look at only the canadian elizabethan stamps uh, and the journal of that is called the corgi times it's published okay. bi-monthly i've been the editor of that for some 23-ish years i in the last issue the january february 
I now announced my retirement in that role, and we are now looking for someone to take over. So of the 112 participants here tonight, if someone is interested to be the editor of the Corby Times, we would certainly uh, hire you on the spot. Thank you all very much. All, all volunteers. So hiring, you'd be all volunteer. So I was sort of right. A corgi is a dog. I was the like, corg yeah, the corgi was the queen's dog, queen's dog which is right. where the, the name came from. Yes. Okay. <laughs> thank I you for the wondered. question. <laughs> Good. Thank you for the clarification on that. Yeah. Mark Dick, you've been waiting for a little bit here. That's all right. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, First off, Robin, thanks so much for for the presentation. the The additions that you've made, especially the sort of the summaries of definitive sets, uh, like you described in the presentation, is something that I've really, really appreciated. Uh, makes it a lot easier to navigate uh, for me. So thank you. I was just stunned, though. Uh, like I, I never considered um, that you were using like InDesign and the way you described how you're just you're just putting it in exactly how it lays out on the page, and I and I really appreciated that because it um, all of us on on the stamp forums that are like, oh, why don't you just you know, it's all a, all in a database. Why don't you just put this stuff online? It would be easy. It's like holy darn, I know it's not. Um, that, that like it's a it's clearly the way you're building it is for print, and and I'm I'm curious because I first knew about you through your website and and some of the. Um, the stuff that you have online around around Machins, and I, I'm just curious if 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 you've ever sort of been I, I don't know I don't I don't want to say frustrated, but just sort of what's it like being locked into this? I'm just viewing a page at a time, and if I get the page right, then I'm then I'm good to go and ship it off to the printer. Like it seems like it's so much more work that way. Initially, it was, but now that it's done, it's I love it. Mm -hmm. InDesign is the best thing for what we do. I have my own I have my own access database of the, all the Canada stamps that I do a lot of searches for stuff. If I have a stamp in front of me and I have text on a word on that stamp, I go to my on my dad my computer database to look for that text, and it tells me immediately what the Scott number is, and and that database links to lots of I've. I, that's my business is database development. Mm. And I've created that database to give me links to lots of stuff. Uh, but the the catalog itself is, as I noted earlier, completely manually done through InDesign. And I love it. It's, oh, I think it's the best thing out there. I have full control over the formatting, which I don't think I would have if it came in from uh, a database. There'd be too many rules and uh, required to lay it out. And even then, I don't think it would come in the way I want it to. Thank you for the question. All right. Hugh Jeffries. Hi, Robin. Hugh Jeffries, um, editor of the Stanley Gibbons catalog. Um, nice to meet you. I just wanted to say what a great So it's like midnight. It's midnight there in uh, England, isn't it? It is, yes. Yes. Boy, a I've, nighter, like many other I've staff stayed up late to to, <laughs> to, to oh, see nice. your presentation. Oh, thank you. But it's so worth much. it. <laughs> thank you. I miss I miss my supper for this because it's my supper time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm missing bedtime. Um yes, I want to say how, how much I enjoyed the presentation and um obviously I share a certain amount of your thoughts and hopes and trying to develop a, something new for the catalogue every year. Um, one thing, I don't have to do anything. I, I, I just hand over all the database and typesetting and illustration issues to somebody else because that's not my field at all. So I'm I, I, I'm very impressed that you, you deal with that. Um, are you really a one-man band or do you have uh, a, a team of assistants with proofreaders and what have you on hand to uh, to assist i do 99.9 percent .9 of the catalog work um, i do have a number as i mentioned earlier a number of people who send me pricing information and then i manually put in the pricing information i do uh send off the new 
like the last, so let's, the, so usually we put about five or six pages are required for new Canada Post issues every year. So those five or six pages, when I'm done, I create a PDF and it's sent off to about a five or six people who I ask to proof it. Um, there are parts of the catalog that I send, again, per, on my screen, he's in the lower left corner, Mirko Zatka. He usually gets a proof of all of the Elizabethan era that he then goes through and uh, checks different things. Uh, but it's 99% me, one person. That's uh, that's truly impressive. And I, I love have, it. I love it. I did have one, one yeah. more specific query mm -hmm. um, because I got your uh 2023 catalog uh last year um when i was reviewing our own canada listings and i spotted that you had deleted quite a lot of the um perforated ohms um stamps uh was that because i i do understand because you said earlier that they were in an a, an earlier listing but and, and I think you said um, that they had not been officially produced. But does that mean that um, we are now aware that things that were originally listed are now felt to be forgeries? Um, uh, I uh, the answer I would give would be based on hearsay, and I don't want to go down that road. No, no. Uh, I don't know how accurate it is. It probably is accurate, but I don't really want to go down that road. Garfield Porch just put his hand up. He could probably speak more to that, where the road I was going to go down. Um, our listings were initially taken from Wrigley's catalog, and it's turned out that many of those varieties are not legit. And uh, there are fakes and forgeries on OHMS because of the pricing. People will try and do it. Um, uh, so a lot of work has been done over the last couple of years by the names that I had mentioned when I did that little blurb of that page. And they, and along with Garfield, I'm sure, with his machine at the Vinnie Green, the Vincent Grace Green Philatelic Foundation in Toronto, um, in their expertising yeah. department. Um, I may, I'll let Garfield speak more to that. We've, we found that stuff doesn't, it shouldn't be in there. Yeah. Well, I, I, I suspect our listing, which predates my editorship happily um was probably found, um taken from the same source probably yes so mm -hmm. um I, I, I should um i should speak to your experts and um and, and see what we should do about ours but so thank you very much that's very kind and thank you congratulations once again uh, thanks for staying up late <laughs> no, no that's I, worth I... it I know Garfield, you'll probably contribute to this. I just want to say, Mark, I see you. We will get to you. I thank you for being so patient. I think Garfield, there has something on on this very topic of forgeries. Yeah, thanks, Joan. Uh, yeah, at the uh, at the Green Foundation, um, which uh, if people aren't aware, is the the foremost uh, expertising body for Canadian philatelic material. Uh, we found after getting the VSC 6000 in 2014, that there were a lot of, uh, shall we say, questionable uh, OHMS perforated stamps coming through. And uh, in uh, 2016, uh, Gary Thomason and John Johnson, who wrote the book for the Banaps website, uh, very kindly donated all of their research material to the Green Foundation. And I started putting that kind of stuff into our database with the with the VSC six thousand, um, and then we found out how wrong we had been in the in the past with a lot of our certificates. And then in uh, early in twenty eighteen, we got a, a submission from a person who shall go unnamed, but he sent in thirty two stamps, all perforated OHMS five hole. And using the, the Johnson and Thomason database, we determined that 29 of those were bad. Uh, there's there's a lot of terrible stuff out there floating around. Uh, so the um, I, I think Gary and John and in cooperation with the Green and and certainly with with Robin, 
uh, found it was better to go with the with a revised listing of of OHMSs, and the erroneous garbage was taken out of the out of the catalog. And Robin, thank you an awful lot for that. That was a that was a huge step, and I think it required a bit of courage too to uh, to do it because there are a lot of people uh, fired questions to us saying, "What the heck's going on? Uh, you know, what are you doing to us?" But uh, there was just a lot of bad stuff out there, and I think it was time to start from scratch again. And and this is what uh, what Gary and John have done, and uh, and I think that Robin's very, um, amendment to the catalog has addressed this restart very very nicely indeed so uh, you know two thumbs up folks it's uh but if you've got the uh, five whole ohms and uh and you got certificates on them that are older than 2017 uh forget it there's no guarantee on those certificates anymore uh there there are better ways of determining uh the ohms now than we've ever had Thank you, Garfield. Thanks, Robin. Yeah. Mark, you've been waiting. Mark Armstrong. His hand is up, but he had already asked a question. Uh, no, I, no, I asked previously. Thank you. Oh, okay, your hand was still up. All right. Okay, I, here's a really great philosophical question here from Marcel. Presently, Recently used stamps are harder to find than mint ones. Do you know why it's not reflecting this in the catalogs? Well, we could price the used stamps at more than mint price. <laughs> that was the, I guess that's the direction. I, that's how I interpret that philosophical. Yeah. <laughs> but someone right. could then take a mint stamp and cancel it and then say it's worth more. Those are canceled to orders, and uh, that's not right either. I would discourage that uh, practice. Yeah, then we'd have to and go to Garfield and get the cancellation <laughs> checked up. Well, and there were uh, there's actually a little corner note on one of the pages in the unit trade that says, watch out for fraudulent uh, counterfeit cancellations. They were being done in, we won't name the town or city or province, but out east. <laughs> uh, in Canada, uh, so yes, buyer, buyer, we there, to, buyer, beware there as well. No, that's a great question. Used stuff is very, very hard to find these days, uh, particularly cancelled properly. And yeah, really, Bob Vogel, Paul Deloshaw again. Uh, in that vein, in terms of pricing, uh, my question to you, Robin, is. Why are all modern Canadian stamps valued at double the price of the stamp? In other words, the face value of the stamp as a starter. Uh, and that seems to be a standard approach uh, with the catalog. And it seems to me that that might be uh, a problem. I think that's just a standard practice that's been done over the years. And perhaps it is something that we should look at uh, where historically with the brick and mortar stamp dealers shops that, in, in terms of storing stuff for years and then the more and required you know you, they have to make a profit too but in this day and age is that really practical but i think everyone online here knows that you can go to an auction by postage at a fraction of face value uh, in quantity and um sometimes for, sometimes far less than half face value yeah and then i've got a lot of postage here sitting here that i need to use up so i don't get <laughs> <laughs> spoiled that it get uh, wrecked that way but uh, so, no, so I, I guess the point is is that the uh, the pricing in the catalog is essentially just a guide and uh, we should all recognize that I it's not, it, it doesn't I, it doesn't identify reality that's a, a an answer i should have given when you asked the question <laughs> thanks uh, hi robin right. uh great presentation uh Thanks just a little bit off topic why don't you tell some of your, your other publications on some of yeah. your other studies? Yeah. Uh, maybe people would like to hear what you do yourself to enhance the hobby. Well, I think we're supposed to be done in three minutes, so I don't know if we have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> you have no, all I, the time I, you want. All the time you want. I didn't want to make this about that. This was to be about the Unitrade catalog. and uh, uh, I have a, a genuine love for 
Canadian definitive stamps and the Great Britain Machen stamps. And uh, if you go to my website, I think you see the results of that. Um, I love working on the Elizabethan books that I do. I'm still working on some of that at the moment. I'm uh, working hard on the Low Martin coil die cutting. There are over 7,000 unique coiled die cutting varieties on just 130 or so stamps that uh, if, uh, if people are wanting all the different perforation varieties listed from the olden days, each one of these 7,000 stamps is unique and different, different perf, different uh, stuff. They should all be listed in the catalog, but we can't put that in there. It would The novice collector would get so overwhelmed, they would quit. They wouldn't even start collecting if they saw all of this uh, unique stuff that was going on. But no, that's that's where I'm, I'm really interested right now. It, it, that's my current project, plus updating my other books. Uh, um, I, again, I, I, I'll leave it at that. I, this should be about the unit trait. <laughs> but thanks, you, Bob. Go to my website. Send you're, me you're, way, you're way too <laughs> modest, Rob, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in a couple of months in Ottawa. Thanks so I'll much. Bye-bye. I'll be at Dora Pex in Ottawa, yes. See you, anyone there. Thank you. Robin, what is your website? I know you shouldn't either. <laughs> Just because we mentioned it, we should. Adminware.ca, A-D-M-I-N-W-A-R-E dot C-A. My business is Adminware Corporation. I start, I'm a software developer. So Adminware came from the word software. I developed administrative software. So Adminware. Um, Thank you very much. Most of what I do these days is stamp stuff. I, I, I still do some database and website development, but most of it is stamp related these days if i if i may just sneak in and maybe help uh, answer a previous question about the valuation of recent used canadian stamps so before Merco continues uh, sorry Merco. so yeah. Merco is one of the people that provides pricing information and and gives me lots of uh, new varieties and pricing information on the canadian elizabethan stamps he is a a, a dealer and has his own website with a shop and so on. He So continue, please, Merkel. Yeah, thanks. I, I just wanted to add that we're very aware of the fact that uh, modern Canadian stamps are very hard to find now, given that there's such a much lower volume of mail that's that's being handled by Canada Post these days. So we have over the years tried to raise the prices to be more appropriate. Um, I think the last two or three issues have looked at certain issues and certain values, and they've been boosted up. I'm not sure that I remain that I'm convinced that the used value should be higher than the mint values. Uh, it could be argued that for souvenir sheets where you have unique perforated stamps as compared to die cut stamps and booklets and so on, they might be worth more used than mint, but we've never done that. And again, that's something that I'm not sure is right. But we are trying to be more fair in recognizing the, the rarity of these scares or the, the scarcity of these stamps. Thank you, Mirko. And if I could just add to that one, uh, Mirko, I think that one of the things we have to be aware of is that uh, somebody pointed out earlier, you can take all these hundreds of millions of dollars of postage that's just floating around in collections and if the if the price goes up, they're going to go and get it cancelled. And I think we've got to consider that the cancellations that are going to be really valid are the ones that are dated in period, not not just not just arbitrarily cancelled, but dated in period. Yes, the catalog also tries to address the the quality of the cancellations. The CDS, the classical CDS cancels, are worth quite a bit more on used stamps. But you're right that in date uh, or, you know, within a year or two of, of issue um, proved that they were used at the time and are genuine use. That's true. Uh, talking back to the uh, modern stamp, Paul Delonsha again, um, can it be suggested that right now the catalog only only uh, refers to a used stamp as a fine stamp? Um, is it possible to uh, maybe make a notation somewhere in the introduction uh, whereby you would consider saying, okay, fine, if you've got a fine stamp, if you if you would like to look at that, if you do feel you have a very fine stamp, maybe you should add 1.4% uh, to 1.40 to the value of the used stamp, make a general notation. I'm not asking that that you actually introduce a very fine category, but 
but uh, there may there has to be something to reflect the value associated with used stamps and potentially a higher value associated with a say for example a mid stamp that is extra fine as an example so a 1.4 classification might be the way to deal with it right oh, so that's, that's the premium that a collector will pay to a willing collector will pay a willing vendor though right and right the market so, the market will settle I mean, up very your, quickly yeah but in terms of just valuing the stamp you know uh to be sold uh, say by a best pocket dealer or something of that nature people are asking the question all the time right how would you value you extra fine or how would you value a fine to a very fine and uh argumentally uh, you know they're saying oh come on you know right so it's it's several places throughout the catalog i just happened to open up here here's page right. 337 in the current edition I don't know if I'm going to get me in there. I can't because as soon as I put it up, I hide it. Yeah. But there are little boxes, and it's the same box repeated about every 50 pages or so that does reference used VFXF pricing within period circular date pricing premium. And there's a paragraph that talks about adding 50%, adding 100%. Uh, right. Uh, uh, that kind of idea. Perhaps we need to put that in the introduction where now that everyone has seen it, at least 115 people tonight have seen the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. I'm being, I'm being half the sheesus there, but I, I, a lot of people don't look at the introduction. I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Good. I, good to see Hugh shaking his head too. There, <laughs> he agrees. <laughs> Duncan, don't you have you? Yes. Uh, 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 whilst there's a lull in the conversation. Uh, reflecting uh, cancellations, uh, one of the GP, GBPS meetings, someone commented that, uh, oh, yes, for our modern cancels, we have the type one cancel and the type two cancel. The type one is a Sharpie and the type two is a biro, which is the English name for a ballpoint. Uh, I will we say that one Canada of the stamp also. dealers, <laughs> a few of the stamp dealers uh, I deal with do manage to get them cancelled with the self -ink inking. Uh, counselors uh, and the the rest of my British mail gets either the uh, Barry's Bay Mood hand stamp or the Barry's Bay Avril Arrow commemorative hand stamp on postal postage from the UK if it's escaped being cancelled with a biro at Gateway. Mm -hmm. A lot of mail in Canada doesn't get cancelled, even with the we referred earlier to the tagging question came up. It's supposed to. Uh, face the envelope and get it cancelled but they, they don't get cancelled i get a lot of mail and actually i'm in a little town in my post office and i've told them when we moved out here stop putting a pen cancel through it and they have a little note on my post office box now and, and they've been pretty darn good of course i don't get much mail anyway with stamps on it but uh <laughs> well at least you get your mail delivered sometimes i mail things to canada and um it doesn't get there but uh, I think you could say that for the U.S. too. Well, so. that old border gets in the way, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. we're in a non-letter carrier office, so it gets delivered to our mailbox. Or if it's too big to get into into the mailbox, that's really lucky. If it's big enough to get into the mailbox, but not out through the door at the front, then you have to go to the counter and ask them to take it out. <laughs> yeah, been there, done that. Yeah. Oh. Rick? Hi, Rick. Nice background. I love the guy. I love yeah. I love the stamps. Oh, nice. Right. Spe special for our group here, yes. Um, like to say, several years ago, I made the decision I really wanted to try to complete my collections with used stamps because they are more challenging than mint. Basically, um, um, you know, you get mint, you have the money, you can find it. I'm talking about yeah. Commonwealth, especially Commonwealth abroad and everything else. You know, on, on the older stamps, yeah, you got to be suspicious, but you can learn what the cancellations were like. But the other thing I found is that dealers don't offer the used stamps. Um, and now I get several uh, auction catalogs from Great Britain and, and from Canada. I think we lost you, Rick. When he comes back, we could finish that. Right. Uh, 
Right. I see Gilles, Gilles Morel has uh, yeah. hand up. I'm, uh, Robin, one of the difficulty uh, I'm, I'm finding with uh, the new listing of the catalog is that you probably know it's at the end of the, the, the section, there is a series dealing with uh, the new permanent or the new uh, uh, printed vended machine stamps. And uh, there's a fair differences in value, for example, from uh, the various numbers like the 18 digits versus 14 digits. Uh, but what I'm finding out now is that uh, I had the first version and the word is almost fading. I could not uh, read the, the 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 value of the stamps anymore. So does anybody came across that? And is there any solution to protect uh, the perennity of those stamps? Because eventually they're all going to be just a, a label with a painting, a color painting. All the uh, printing is disappearing with, with time. So those are those problem. those values and numbers that you're alluding to are thermal printed. That's yes. the problem. And thermal printing just it disappears. And it I don't unless someone out there that, that's listening has an answer, I I think they're all gonna go blank <laughs> sooner than later. Not all. Yeah. yeah. I think the answer is Gilles to make a photocopy as soon as you buy the stuff and mount the photocopy beside it in the yeah. album. Well, I, I decided to start using mine while at least I could try to get a cancel. So I know this is relative period, but with the permanent one, some of those are uh, back to nineteen uh, to 2016. So uh, <clears throat> it's hard to say. But so far, Canada Post keep uh, considering they're valid because they went through the system. So we have a section in the catalog. It's called Computer Vended Postage. Is the yeah. title of that, and there are still machines, a few machines out there. Mirko could uh, uh, talk to this because he uh, has hunted these down, also. Yeah. So the the original group of seven issues, like you, you mentioned, the eighteen digit set, uh, <clears throat> I still have a number of them in sets uh, with varieties and and what have you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and they have not faded, surprisingly. Same with the FDI strip that was issued by Canada Post. I have them still in the original packaging, and they're just as black as when they were issued. Um, I was actually in Vancouver uh, on November 20, uh, 25th um, in 2016 when the 18-digit ones were available, and I bought a number of those. That was the last full day of use of the 18-digit code, as it turned out. But they have not faded. Uh, same with the, the $2.50. Well, that is, I guess, the $2.50 rate. The more recent ones issued in uh, 2019 and through now, yes, they have a much greater tendency to fade. I've never really been able to figure out why. Um, I suspect that it's the thermal printer, that the devices are just aging and that the quality of print and therefore, you know, the resiliency of the black print uh, just fades a lot faster than it, uh, it would have otherwise. Canada Post hasn't really done anything to upgrade any of that equipment. Um, and really the use of it is questionable in the future, although I have heard that uh, with the new rates coming in uh, in May, the new basic rates, uh, these will continue to be used with the new rates. Thanks, Marco. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah. Paul, did you have another question? I've got a yes, question. Yes, I do, actually. Um, uh, just a general comment again uh, for uh, Robin. Um, have you given any further consideration to uh, uh, kind of expanding the commentaries on railway post office stamps? And for example, identifying the current uh, the current publishers of, of railway post office uh, stamp uh, catalogs, uh, uh, as well as maybe a, a commentary in the uh, uh, not in the introduction, but in the details in the introduction area. On RPOs? No, I've never. I'm. I don't know that material, so I'd have to get someone to do that. Uh, I've never thought of doing anything with that. I'll it's a very a interesting area, of course. Sure, certainly. Yeah, I'll make a note to see if there's. Uh... I mean, I'm not asking for a lot of information, but just a just an acknowledgement that that the area does exist and that it is, in fact a uh, collectible area similar to see to um uh 
basically collecting uh, cancellations. Yeah, good thought. Thank you. Rick, right. welcome back. I've got a question. Thank you. Yeah, my, my internet went down, but I'm now borrowing my daughter's internet. So anyway, I'm talking about the used stamps that I, I like to collect and go for. Number one, the dealers, they always grade the used stamps as it was mint. Namely, if it's very well centered, they say, oh, very fine, excellent, even though the cancellation is terrible and there's nothing to see there. But the other thing is they just don't have many used stamps. Right. I mentioned this once to a dealer here in, in Western Canada. He said, you know, I came back from the, the show in Toronto. He said, I could have picked up three copies of the uh, Canada Jubilee issue mint, but no one was offering it used. And, I've, and I found, too, it's very hard to find simply used stamps being offered. That uh, says to me the collection. I want to see what I do. And, Obviously, the, okay. the, price, question. Okay, yeah. the price is difficult to be a rarity, but it also has to reflect collector interest. And, and from Great Britain, boom, boom, mint, mint, mint all over the place. Very hard to find uh, nice use sets being offered. So I think that's a, problem, a question about the pricing is what do the collectors want? So. Mm -hmm. Earlier, I mentioned in my talk, I mentioned uh, earlier on how in the, the 70s, 80s, 90s, my dad and I bought hundreds and hundreds of pounds or kilograms of kiloware. Uh, at that time, it was very common. Then the privacy law came in. I forget when that was, approximately, approximately 2000, let's say. I forget exactly when it was in Canada. And the amount of mission mixtures that became available just dropped significantly because of this privacy law stuff. And you know, these days, it's very hard to get... Uh, quality used mission mixtures which allow collectors and dealers to have a stock of that that material i started on my website uh well maybe a couple of years ago i have now a shopping cart area where i'm trying to dispose of some of my two million used stamps and uh um uh, it, it it's tough finding current good used stuff Someone else was trying to ask a question, but they didn't have their hand up. Uh, Stephen, I think it was. Stephen, down there in the lower left of my screen. Um, yes. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I recently acquired a, an accumulation of worldwide meter mail. And there is a meter mail catalog online for the world. And I'm wondering if uh, that's an area that you might consider as a section in your catalog. So I believe there there was at one time a meter catalog for Canada. It, it would be outside the scope of our catalog. Uh, I don't see that happening for our Unitrade uh, specialized catalog. Certainly a popular area, but I don't see that as being, I don't think it'll come to our catalog. Sorry. I don't want to be, I don't want to come across blunt there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> You'd have volume 10. Yeah, you know, right. You have as many books as you Jeffries does with the Stanley. Right, there you go. <laughs> I guess I'll. I guess I'll just throw them all away. No. <laughs> Why not write the book? <laughs> there you go. Well, well, there's already a an online catalog for meter mail worldwide. So, and there's a section on Canada, but can you share that info? It's not very long. You know where that what that website is? Uh, if you go to the Meter Mail uh, Club website, just Meter Mail. Okay. And then they've got that uh, catalog online, and you can take a look at what they've got on Canada, and see what you think about it. Hmm. One Robin, we I got an interesting, it, yeah. uh, interesting anonymous question a little while ago. What importance of the art of stamp collecting should we teach in schools? Mm -hmm. The art of stamp collecting. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about the art of stamp collecting, but I would say the the act of stamp collecting. I mean, what what's important that we should teach about it? 
high schools had stamp clubs, which would allow them to learn working together in groups, uh, learning uh, organization skills. Uh, my father had a stamp club for years. He was a school high school uh, uh, elementary school principal, and he had uh, stamp clubs for years and years that I went and helped out with the schools. Whatever that formula is, boy, share it. Wow. So interesting you say that, Robin. The, I was just talking to the Postal History Society, I think it is, in Arizona. I, I had to... I'm taking over the youth and adult and the young adult, not a young adult, it's young adult and adult group for the age. They have about 150 um, different curriculum for kids ranging from kindergarten all the way up to college. And they provide them free of charge, the teachers, canceled stamps and printed album pages to help them learn a topic. So if there's any teacher or any school who's interested, They'll give them these stamps and the and the this issue for a moment. Um, there needs to be a lot more uh, atten- uh, emphasis on adult education as it regards stamps. For example, uh, for adult education at the University of Denver, where I've been a facilitator, I put on a program, an eight week. Uh, because I bring in colleagues from the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library to talk about uh, topics uh, uh, associated with world history. And we pick up uh, a few people every time uh, getting interested in stamps as senior citizens. They have the time, and it doesn't have to take a lot of education as it regards to stamp collecting. That's my editorial. Great idea, Stephen. Yeah. Stephen, I think I'll contact you offline to get some ideas for for doing some of that. And I I think you're going to see a big push for education out of the APS and other groups moving moving forward. Well, I've I've tried to encourage them. You're going to find a real change at the APS in this direction. Only because I need help, and if and they need donations, so <laughs> so we'll work it out. But that's great, Stephen. I that's the type of there is a lot of no curriculum for for a lot of these clubs, and I think that's that's really the right direction. Slate and identify rarity factors. Our peels used one unit of measure, Um, squared circle cancellations might use another uh, scope of of factors. Uh, Postal history collectors use a different uh, range of factors so that you got like uh, ABCD, you got alpha, you got numerical. Uh, It's... uh, (laughs) Mark, I think the problem with the rarity factors is that the rarity factors have been been evolved by the specialized study groups. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the 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 large these the uh, squared circles came out of the squared circle study group. I know that, and the the RPO collectors have got their own, which they evolved out of their study group. And I think it's a you know, totally different methodology because uh, most stamp collectors are not statisticians. They're uh, yeah. They're kind of stamp collectors who goes. And, Jump and we at we at the Green Foundation are looking for researchers. Please research and write. We want your information. <laughs> hmm. Jill, you have your hand back up. Uh, yes, uh, just uh, one uh, comment. I just wanted to, to uh, express uh, my compliment to the bear market. All of them are discovery. So just going to the back of your book on topical, all those people are listed. That became very useful because it points me to uh, like the around CapEx uh, 84, I believe, where there were three different uh, souvenir sheet and series of all the in the discovery. So I posed that to her and all of a sudden, STEM become the connection to connect the history that all 
helping her to do her home. She has still her album in my drawer here. But now, you know, I try to maintain that connection because eventually I've got a, a full connection of Canadian that uh, Canadian stamp somebody's going to need. But huh? there is a connection with school, with history. That's what hooked me on stamp 60 years ago, like uh, the connection with seven history. And that's probably one uh, common team. I think uh, Stephen Adler mentioned that and Jones. So. About uh, connecting. Okay. Are we, I, I would are like we to all talked out? You's going to sleep. <laughs> so is Keith. So I, is... I, thank you. Thank you so much to everyone for the invite, for everyone for listening, the ideas that came forward. Uh, I'll have to go back to the tape. I did... I'd, I'd like to make an observation. This is, uh, this is our third survey that we've done on catalogs. You know, we've done uh, Michelle, we've done uh, Stanley Gibbons, and now we've looked at Unitrade. One thing that, that stands out to me out of all of the things that we've seen and discussed is the importance of those front pages, the introductions on each of these catalogs, because they're a Rosetta Stone that will really take you to the answer to your question if you if you know how to ask that question and read them thoroughly. I know, especially with the in the past that were detailed, I went to the to the introduction and of course, there it was, it was outlined very clearly. And I, th I think a lot of us, especially seasoned collectors, take it for granted when they get a new catalog or whatever else, you know, oh, the catalog, and then they go through it and think they know everything. But the little subtle changes that occur over time in that, they're they're contained in that front zone there. And I think it's it's incumbent on us as, you know, users of these tools, you know, to look in there and, and find these answers. Let's throw in one other plug. Sure. Uh, again, this is for the, for the green. Uh, for, for those who are doing any kind of research, and you have to go beyond the catalogs, um, the Green Foundation Library is now back up and totally running. We have a, we now have a fully qualified full-time librarian in there, and uh, she's just taken to the philatelic aspect like a duck to water, and is quite anxious to knowledge and her willingness to help. Her name is Natalie Mitchell, and she's just a, she's a delightful young lady, but uh, smart as a whip. Thank you very much for that, Garfield. I think poor Natalie is going to um, might not like it when she gets all these calls. But oh, she! I'll tell you, she's she loves it. She's uh, she's just delighted to to work with people, and uh, she's been very popular with everybody so far, and uh, just the most accommodating young lady. Oh, that's terrific! Just call, just phone her and say hi. Oh, <laughs> definitely do that. Uh, you know, I haven't even explored what's in the green library, so that's a good start. Okay, the Rocky Mountain of what the what's there? Mm. <laughs> Going to take you a long time. There, there, there is a full catalog online on the on the Green Foundation's website. So, if you're looking for a title, uh, just just go in and check it out on the. Uh, so I, I, thank you. Thank you so much to everyone for the invite, for everyone for listening, the ideas that came forward. Uh, I'll have to go back to the tape. I didn't write down some of them. I'll have to go back to the tape to re refresh my memory. But thank you so much. And I hope we have, knock on wood, we have a 2025 edition uh, rather than having to wait a year or two on this. So, mm -hmm. You're right. Fantastic. Well, job, like, Robin. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to make an observation. This is uh, This is our third survey that we've done on catalogs you know we've done uh michelle we've done uh stanley gibbons and now we've looked at unitrade one thing that that stands out to me out of all of the things that we've seen and discussed is the importance of those front pages the introductions on each of these catalogs because they're a rosetta stone that will really take you to the answer to your question if you if you know how to ask that question and read them thoroughly i know especially with the uh, michelle catalog there's a, a wonderful introduction in that that's available in English, and it translates everything you need to know to follow through that catalog, regardless of the language being used. And I know in the case of the Unitrade, I, there's a lot of questions that I've had in the past that were detailed. I went to the to the introduction, and of course, there it was. It was outlined very clearly. And I, th I think a lot of us, especially seasoned collectors, take it for granted when they get a new catalog or whatever else, you know, oh, the catalog, and then they go through it and think they know everything. But 
the little subtle changes that occur over time in that they're they're contained in that front zone there and i think it's it's incumbent on us as you know users of these tools you know to look in there and, and find these answers i agree thank you that's pretty good so all right are we are we all talked out let's go have some dinner Joan, can I just throw in one other plug? Sure. Uh, again, this is for the for the green uh, for for those who are doing any kind of research, and you have to go beyond the catalogs. Uh, the Green Foundation Library is now back up and totally running. We have a we now have a fully qualified full time librarian in there, and uh, she's just taken to the philatelic aspect like a duck to water, and is quite anxious to help anybody who wishes to call in. So if you go to the Green Foundation website, you, the telephone numbers and the and the librarian's uh, email address is there. Uh, please take full advantage of, uh, of of her knowledge and her willingness to help. Her name is Natalie Mitchell, and she's just a, she's a delightful young lady, but uh, smart as a whip. Thank you very much for that, Garfield. I think. Poor Natalie is going to um, might not like it when she gets all these calls, but oh, she! I'll tell you, she's she loves it. She's uh, she's a, she's a new librarian, and what we said to her is, "This is your library." So, and she has taken ownership, and uh, the more business she gets, the happier she is. She's just delighted to to work with people, and uh, she's been very popular with everybody so far, and. Uh, just the most accommodating young lady. Oh, that's terrific. Just call it, just phone her and say hi. Oh, <laughs> definitely do that. Uh, you know, I haven't even explored what's in the green library, so that's a good start. Okay. The Rocky Mountain, as you mentioned, there's a lot of great, great resources that um, I think are not really put out there. So, anything right, else? Visit, visit the library for a couple of months. You might get a brief overview of what the, what's there. Oh. <laughs> Good to take you a long time. There, there, there is a full catalog online on the on the Green Foundation's website. So, if you're looking for a title, uh, just just go in and check it out on the uh, on the the website. It's Pretty accurate. Let's say it's 95, 98% accurate now. That's pretty good. Susan, welcome. I've been here the whole time listening, um, but I wanted to add to what Garfield said. I'm on the um, email newsletter distribution for the Green Library, and it comes out periodically, and there's always some little interesting tidbits in there that you might appreciate. Hmm. That's really good to know. And I just, uh, I think Garfield hooked me up somehow initially, but I've been getting them for a while and I find them very useful. Yeah, so if you want to get on that list, just drop Natalie an email and you'll be on that list forever. <laughs> well, I would just put in a plug for the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library because uh, I'm the finance committee chairman oh. and we're probably the second largest philatelic library in the united states and uh we have uh, a full-time librarian and uh, uh other than that it's all volunteers we have two buildings each one is about uh, three thousand square feet and they're fully paid for uh, we have a lot of money in reserve so we're not going to go anywhere and we have a website and you can put in RMPL or Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library. Uh, there's a connection to the union catalog, which is uh, connected with the APS as well. So uh, the RMPL is a nice uh, 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 family friendly uh, library and everybody's welcome to visit and uh, check out the website. Where's that located, Stephen? That's in Denver, Colorado. Okay, thank you. Oh, 
great resources. Come here more often. Look at all this. Yeah, you know, because sometimes when you search the net, that isn't, it, it doesn't go far enough, doesn't go deep enough for a lot of the research. And we do, we do uh, at least, I think, three auctions a year from donations. And uh, uh, you can really get some good deals. Yeah, and uh, the uh, library does uh, pay for an advertisement in the APS journal. So it's in there every month, a little ad. And uh, of course, we're connected with the uh, Rocky Mountain Map Show. I'm sorry, Rocky Mountain uh, Stamp Show in May of every year as well. And we're actually the center of the United States, being in Denver. Yeah, Denver is a, it's a fun place to fly into and out of. <laughs> <laughs> well, the snow we just got in Manitoba was from a Colorado low, straight from Denver. Thank you so much. <laughs> we turned our sprinkler systems on. Yeah. We've had so little snow here, the farmers need it. So I, I actually, I am genuine in that. Thank you for the snow <laughs> that we got. <laughs> if you're in Denver, you should go to the Brown Hotel to the bar and uh, order their homemade potato chips. They're fantastic. At least they were 10 years ago. <laughs> if you, you can afford it. Now. Well, again, thank you so much to everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure.